Okay. Well, uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, be able to come and share uh, some of our experiences and some of the new lessons we've learned with mycoplasma. Uh, mycoplasma is certainly, uh, and this is our group at the Swine Vet Center, so the information I'm sharing with you today isn't myself, it's from the entire crew, not just me. But uh, what I'm going to talk about this, this afternoon is a little bit on the new diagnostics, a little bit on guilt exposure, a little bit on how to eliminate. I'm not going to go into great uh, detail on that because I've done that before. And then just update a little bit on success rates. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, the disease itself. We know it costs us an average daily gain, feed efficiency, and increased cost of medication. I did want to spend just a minute on reviewing some things with mycoplasma, some of the hallmarks that help us in control and help us in exposure, our control, control and elimination. And so one of the things to remember is piglets are born mycoplasma free. So all the piglets when they're born aren't uh, colonized, but they do become colonized uh, very rapidly after they're born, and all pi piglets can be, of all ages can be colonized. Uh, the shedding dam is the most influential risk factor to how uh, severe a disease we're going to see in the grow finish. And the proportion of pigs that are infected will have an impact on, on that as well. And animals can shed up to 240 days. So that's some of the basis of what we're going to talk about here and some of the uh, things that help us in the control. And if, if you've got a positive herd and you're going to maintain a positive herd, I think this is the one lesson that I'd have you learn out of all the slides is you have to start, if you're getting negative pigs into your system, you have to start at an early age with exposure to get adequate immunity so that you're not shedding high numbers to these wean pigs. So we can send out a pig with low, uh, low numbers of organism, and we know that 240-day time frame, so we have to work backwards from farrowing to get those animals exposed. And what that means is we need to be exposing those animals by about the time they're about 50 days of age. So we need to have that exposure early on, and we need to make sure everyone gets exposed. Uh, Dr. Peters and Fano did a real nice job with this chart. A white pig is a low incidence or negative pig, and you can see as they get more intensely colored, and what you want to do is have a sow that's not shedding by the time she farrows. And so that's really the key to control, if you're doing a control program and being able to work back uh, far enough. So if you're getting mature animals in as replacements, you're going to have difficulty in controlling mycoplasma. And uh, this was some work from Rojos looking at uh, how many gilts does it take to expose. If I give, if I have positive gilts with negative gilts, I have to have six in ten gilts to get them exposed. That doesn't work. You can't get that many numbers. You can't have that big a gilt pool. And so there's some other things we got to do uh, to be able to understand that. And if we look at some of the, uh, I worked with Dr. Daniel Linares at Iowa State, and we put the, took some of our data, put it into their economic model to look at uh, the cost of mycoplasma and the cost of elimination. And so the basic reduction in costs are antibiotic and vaccination use and better perform. Whoops, better performance. And when we put those numbers together, and we looked at the production cost using. Uh, we, we had a database with about seven years worth of data that we pulled into this database, and we came out with about five dollars. Uh, Daniel's model came out with about five dollars a pig as far as a cost, and so uh, definitely costing costing a lot. And then when we looked at uh, the return on investment or the time it took to pay back the cost of an elimination program, uh, if we do the herd closure and medication, it was about 3.1 months. If we do a whole herd medication with an injectable like a Duraxin, it was 11 months. So, again, a high rate of return. Uh, so, again, I said I wasn't going to spend a lot of that because the other speakers are going to talk more to that. Uh, but some of the improved diagnostics, we've had serology, but it's been difficult to interpret and slow to interpret, so not a very good tool. Oral fluids, great tool for PERS, great tool for PED, poor tool for mycoplasma. It just doesn't work very well. The laryngeal swabs uh, was kind of a breakthrough here a couple years ago in being able to have a better tool to understand uh, mycoplasma, but it does, they do go away <laughs> over time, and so the numbers go down. And the tracheal samples, where we actually get the sample from the trachea today, are probably the best sampling we can do on the live animal. 
And so again, the laryngeal swab, uh, using a speculum here, and this is showing the spoon technique where uh, you have the spoon and you get that, and that's what we take for the swab. And then this is the tracheal swab, one of the forms of the tracheal swabs. There's several different types out there. So you can use the laryngoscope and uh, go ahead and do the tracheal swab. You just have to wait for the pig to breathe to pass it on through. And there's also a technique that people do where they blindly pass uh, the tracheal swab, which has been uh, pretty effective. Once you get used to it, it does uh, work pretty well. And what we've learned, the takeaway message there, is that the tracheal swabs have lower CT values. They're going to give us higher positives. They're going to be longer. If animals are exposed, we're going to find them positive longer. So again, probably the test preferred, just not as easy a test as uh, oral fluids for sure. So again, the tracheal bronchial swab is the best, and the oral fluids probably being the poorest test, and there's lots of variation in between. So how do we get these gilts positive? Uh, we talked about the natural exposure, just not a very effective means. Uh, and again, the earlier we can do it, the better. The intratracheal injection, we'd started doing more of these for the eliminations to establish that time zero. Um, I said I did one project where we did 1,300 gilts, and by the 1,300 gilt, I was crawling from gilt to gilt, and I said there's got to be a better way. And then we started looking at the aerosol exposure. Uh, to do either one of these techniques, we have to have a, a lung homogenate. And so, again, if you're interested in doing this or wanting to look at it, let me know later. We can go into the details. I'm not going to take the time out of the, uh, the conversation today to do that. But you prepare your lung homogenate. If you're going to do the intratracheal with the catheter, again, you have to restrain the animal, use a speculum, uh, go down into the trachea, and they really don't like it very well when you uh, inject something into their trachea. About five mils in, they don't like it, and when you get to 20 mils in, they really don't like it. And this is the fogging method, uh, using a really sophisticated machine, the Hurricane Fogger, uh, and they seem to do a good job. You can see we're generating here, we're doing some replacement gilts, uh, various stages because we were doing a closure, and so we we're trying to get all the animals exposed. And you can see you can generate a pretty good fog uh, in those rooms. And again, if you want some specifics on that, we can talk some more through the questions. And this is doing a gestation barn to homogenize a herd, and you can see there's a little bit of fog in there. And this is just another picture within the barn to try and pick up uh, the level of fog we've got. And it is a technology that's being rapidly adapted for herds that are either going into a stabilization program or going into uh, a closure uh, or an elimination program. Uh, we, we added up the numbers. There's 34 farms uh, that we knew of that were using the technology and about 125,000 sows. And this was getting ready to go fog by G-Barn, so a lot of foggers uh, ready to go out and uh, do the job. So again, uh, somewhat of the new technology. This is one uh, for testing, another new technology for testing, been used for PERS, uh, where you take the aluminum foil and you use just a Swiffer uh, to go across that. And it's actually worked fairly well in these fogging uh, barns where we've gone in and fogged. Uh, you just lay that out while you're doing the fogging process, take the Swiffer, and then you can harvest the sample off of there. Uh, the CT values are lower, are higher numbers than what your actual uh, homogenate is that's going out in the air, but you're getting a lot of dilution. So, uh, but it's been pretty repeatable uh, on the ones that we've done it in. And I put um, these last couple slides in on elimination. Uh, and one of the questions I've always gotten when people talk about elimination is how likely are we to stay negative? And yeah, I might keep my cell farm negative, but all my pigs grow in Northwest Iowa. And uh, they're going to get recontaminated from lateral introduction from other herds. And so we went to uh, southwest Minnesota and northwest Iowa, and we monitored 100 different sites of negative pigs, known negative sources, put those pigs into those barns, and we only had six sites or 6% become infected in uh, pig-dense areas. So yes, it happens. It just doesn't happen very frequently. So lateral in introductions happen, but not very frequently. And this is some work we did uh, looking at survival curves on herds where we did the herd closure and medication versus just doing a whole herd injection. And so you can see the whole, the herd closure and medication certainly has a better track record over time. But 
uh, at the end of the, at, at when you get eight months out on the whole herd injections, uh, they've been pretty good after that as well. We just haven't had as many of those to do. And so, again, um, both methods can be successful. It's just at what rate. And uh, this is looking at a, just under 200,000 sows worth of data. Uh, negative to date, 76% uh, on the herd closure, 53% on the medication. And if we look at the time, over four years uh, of those herds staying negative. So I, I do believe they're, they're uh, truly, truly negative herds. And so in summary, uh, mycoplasma is still a problem to the industry. Uh, herds need to be stabilized. If you've got a positive herd and you're going to keep it positive, you've got to stabilize it. We need good exposure in the GDU. It needs to be young. It needs to be done mm -hmm. around 50 pounds. Intertracheal or fogging, both are good options. Going to get it done. And we have to have that time, like we said, to establish the immunity. And uh, again, you have to stabilize the herd first. That's really the first step, whether you're going to live with mycoplasma or whether you're going to eliminate mycoplasma. Uh, first step is stabilization. The finishers can stay negative even in pig dense areas. And uh, looking at the, the data that uh, uh, the numbers that we have as far as herd staying negative over time and looking at the economics that Daniel put to it, uh, again, it looks like a very good return on investment. And uh, in summary, mycoplasma free uh, is certainly possible uh, in the industry today. So we'll hold for the questions.